Welcome to Faculty Showcase. Uh, it is great to see so many collaborators here and so many potential collaborators. Uh, my name is Mahmoud. My last name is even difficult for me to pronounce, so let's not worry about that. And I'm here to give you just a very small example of my own research that we do on nuclear. Of course, it's a very big field, so at the end I give you a list, but this one is just about my research. It's all about me. Right, but before I do that, I just would like to ask a question. Who here thinks that coal energy is more expensive than nuclear? Put your hands up. Um, don't be shy. Who thinks coal is more expensive than nuclear? Is it just me? Right. Clear oh, two. Okay. Clearly a very biased uh, audience, especially since our EDF friend are sitting there. Uh, it depends how you calculate it and what you take into account. But the fact is, this is my favorite one that shows nuclear is almost uh, cheaper than anything else. But regardless of how you calculate it, the fact is 20% of our electricity, 20% is coming from nuclear. Now, I live in Bristol. I am a fan of renewables as much as the next person living in Bristol. It's a very green city. But the wind, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. So our base load has to come from somewhere. And right now, the, the current thinking, especially of the government, is that nuclear is the answer. Otherwise, they wouldn't be spending 250 million pounds on reviving the industry and getting back our research. Right, so my research is about generation four nuclear power plants. It's the ones that are, we are going to build in 2050. They are a lot high temperature, a lot high pressure, a lot more economical. But we have a little bit of a chicken, and I absolutely love this picture. Uh, I ha uh, we have a chicken and egg problem. We don't know how the materials are going to react in such demanding environment. And until we have the appropriate materials to build those very harsh conditions, that's picture of a fusion, we are not going to see how those conditions are going to react with our materials. So do we build the reactor first and see how our materials are going to behave, or do we need to build, uh, uh, see how the materials be behave so we can build the reactor? I'm a mechanical engineer. If it's up to me, I would love to get a hunk of steel, irradiate it massively, take it to the lab downstairs. You're more than welcome to go and have a look. Stick it into a big machine that I can see and touch and pull it apart and see how its mechanical behavior is. Unfortunately, health and safety does not allow me to do that because uh, if I have a hunk of irradiated steel, maybe some alarms will go on. So what we do instead is we do the test our, on very, very small specimen. That specimen here that we have tested is five micrometer in diameter. For people unlike me who are blessed with hair, your hair is about six micrometer on average, the diameter. So that is thinner than your hair. But how do we test it? We have to take it to large, to large national uh, laboratories. This one is diamond synchrotron. It's three times bigger than a football pitch. And what it does, it takes electrons, puts it into this massive ring, accelerates it so they go round and round, and while they're accelerating, they give off high energy photons photons that are 10,000 times uh, more powerful than what the sun produces. And that photon can go through this specimen. Hopefully you haven't broken any arm or anything, but if you have, when you go to the hospital, they take a CT scan of your broken bone. And that is exactly a very big CT scan that works on uh, big pieces of steel. And in there, because our specimen are smaller, we can irradiate them massively, we can pull them, push them, fracture them while taking 3D pictures and see how does the material behave. And because it's a very small specimen, it doesn't pose any danger to our health. Right. When I was putting this talk together, I was asked to say, why is it that I'm so excited by my research? And I'm a big fan of uh, Silicon Valley, and I think very great things came out of it. And there are many theories about why is that that Silicon Valley is producing such good things? My favorite theory is you get a number of highly motivated, young, innovative people and put them into a small bubble. 
and they're going to think out of the box, and they're going to produce the best thing anyone has ever seen. This young gentleman here is a smiling, it's a beaming smile, because we just have tested, uh, we simulated in synchrotron, effect of a thermal shock on a nuclear power plant. He hasn't slept for three days. He's been up doing tests round the clock. Three o'clock in the morning, on a Saturday, he has this beaming smile. He's motivated, and he motivates me. Find me another person who has that smile at three o'clock in the morning and is not in a nightclub. <laughs> right. So it's not just about me, it's about the nuclear hub. So University of Bristol has this great new initiative, the Southwest Nuclear Hub. If you will, it's a supermarket for nuclear. Whatever happens in nuclear, you can, see, uh, you can, you can, you can come to the hub. It's a structural integrity, cybersecurity, robotics, seismic, control instrumentation, new nuclear fuel. It's everything that Bristol does in nuclear all in one place. And we are not, we are not saying we are selling these things. We want, we, want, we want to match make. If you have a technology that you think is going to be useful for nuclear, come to, to, come to, to us. We have great collaborators we can put you in touch with. EDF Energy, Royce Royce, Sellafield, Column. I forgot um, uh, National Nuclear Lab who are, who, are, who are present here. And it's not just in the UK. We work with China, USA. Um, France, India, Finland, all over the countries. If, if you're going to take a message from this talk, is we are excited, we are motivated, and we do everything nuclear. Be part of something great. Be part of our nuclear hub. Come and talk to us. Thank you very much. <laughs>